Three, two, one. Imagine that you are surrounded by a tropical landscape. And you're waist deep in the ocean. You dive and you paddle through some extremely warm water. And as you do, your biceps grow massive and your legs start doing a kick that almost no one else on the planet knows how to do. And when you come up for air... In the distance, you start to see a lump form. It starts to grow bigger and bigger. It's a huge wave. And you're not afraid, so you kick hard. And you hoist yourself up onto a huge wooden board and begin paddling toward the wave. And at the right moment, you rise out of the water and stand. It's very surprising. Like, you're sort of harnessing this energy that's been sent out through a storm, like, hundreds of miles away, and you meet it right at the perfect moment. And instantly you feel weightless. There's wind in your face. You're just sort of flying. You have become... Duke Kahanamoku, the father of modern surfing. Okay, now is the part where I make you sing the theme song with me. (laughs) You ready? Okay. Terrestrials, terrestrials, we are not the worst, we are the... Best? Best Bestrials. Yeah! (laughs) Perfect. Terrestrials is a show where we uncover the strangeness waiting right here on Earth and sometimes break out into song. There's so much to discover when you look real close. Terrestrials, terrestrials. So drop in and surf the terrestrials. Terrestrials, terrestrials. Good voices not required. I am your host, Lula Miller, joined as always by my song bud. What's up? Alan. What is up? (laughs) And today we are telling the story of our only human for this season, Duke Kahanamoku, the man who about a hundred years ago introduced surfing to the world and in the process gave millions of people stuck on land a new way to escape. And I do want to mention that there are parts of today's story that deal with something sad, including somebody who died and the feelings of grief that come afterwards. If that isn't something you want to listen to today, just hang on till next week for our season finale. And if you are still here, let's meet today's storyteller, A.J. Dungo. That's me. He is a skateboarder. A surfer. An illustrator. And he recently wrote a whole comic book. I did a ton of research. A totally true comic book all about Duke. Yeah. Before we get going on Duke's story, can I just ask, have you ever had any cool animal encounters while surfing? Oh my goodness. Every time I go out, we just see something special. I've seen seals, stingrays, a baby whale. Wow. Dolphins are a huge one. They will ride a wave. Hmm. I've been in situations where I see a whole pod coming straight towards me. The times that it's happened, I've ridden with them and it's so cool. They like, no, no. What? Yeah. Wait, so like you're riding and are they, I'm picturing you like in a posse and they're like on either side and you're all riding. What is, is it kind of like that? Uh, It's more like fear driven. Like I'm trying to get away from them. Like I don't, (laughs) I'm not, I'm just scared that I'll be attacked or. Okay, I'll change the musical moment there. (laughs) I was thinking it was like, (gasps) but it's like. (laughs) Yeah. Wait, and so, and are they right? What do you mean they're riding? You like, see their shadow beneath the water and they come towards you. They'll turn really quickly and exit through the back of the wave. You see them get air. And, you know, as a surfer, we're thinking like, you guys are missing the best part of the wave. And maybe they're thinking, you guys are missing the best part of the wave. <laughs> <laughs> Did you grow up loving the water? No, I no, no, not at all. I was... Uh, terrified, I would just sort of sink. The feeling of starting to swallow water and trying to open your eyes in chlorinated water and it just burns. It wasn't fun to get out of your comfort zone. I mean, how did you finally get 
pass that. That would be my uh, late partner, Kristen. Late, meaning she got sick and passed away. We were high school sweethearts, and she was this fearless, confident, beautiful surfer. And she didn't stop surfing, even after she had a surgery that made her lose her leg. I think it was seeing her pick up a board and go out and charge with a smile on her face and ruin her prosthetic leg in the process. I was like, man, when you're in the presence of someone like that, you want to do stuff to impress them, obviously. So he finally put his fear of water aside, hopped onto a surfboard, and wobbly tried to stand so that Kristen would think he was cool. Yeah. <laughs> It worked. And when AJ thinks about how they were able to fall in love while standing on surfboards, and then later, how he was able to get through the worst hurt of his life in losing her, he sees Duke. Despite time and space, there is a connection. To understand what he means, we need to go way back over a hundred years ago, to a time when there probably weren't any surfboards in Southern California. We're gonna zoom thousands of miles over the ocean to the island of Oahu in Hawaii. The year is 1890, and the island is a lot quieter than it is now. And a little baby boy named Duke is born into a big family. In the morning, through the windows, they say, hooey! <laughs> Anybody home? Hooey! This? Let's go to the beach. Is Heather? Kina Upaua. Duke Hanamoku is a great grand uncle to me. She grew up with a big framed portrait of Duke hanging on the wall and hearing stories about him from people who knew him well. Do you think Duke was ever afraid of the water? Oh, no, no. <laughs> she tells me that from the time Duke was tiny. He lived right on the beach. His dad and yeah. uncle would paddle him he out in a canoe and toss him into the waves. You know, their playground was the ocean. I want to read you this passage. AJ pulls out something that Duke himself had written. I hardly remember whether I learned how to walk or swim first. Reading Duke's words for the rest of this episode is Hawaiian radio host Makani Tabura. Out of the water, I am nothing. It's like someone who's so much more comfortable in water than land. As a little boy, Duke would bodyboard on flattened kerosene cans. You're always going to figure out something to do to ride the waves. And as he got older, he started using tools to shape massive planks of wood that would help him harness the power of the wave to ride for even longer and faster. He had to gather the wood, and then he smoothed it out. Now, Duke by no means invented surfing. It had been around for hundreds of years in Hawaii and in other places. It could have originated in South America, where people would ride the waves on these little reed boats called cabalitos. Others say surfing started in Polynesia or Africa. It's impossible to know for sure when or where the first human realized that by slipping a board beneath them, they could stand on water. But by the time Duke appeared, even though surfing was still unknown in most parts of the world, it had become a significant an even spiritual part of Hawaiian culture. Surfing is the greatest thrill of my life. Every day of the year, the water is 70 degrees. Day and night, the waves roll high. I take my sled, coast down the face of the big waves that roll in at Waikiki. But as Duke turned 11 and 12, this sacred part of his life came under threat. Around that time, more and more settlers and tourists were coming to the island grabbing up land and building strange new hotels and schools. And with them came new laws and rules about how Native Hawaiians should live their lives. They're being told their way of life is incorrect. There has to be an activity for someone to escape. And for him, it was surfing and returning to the water. On a board, I felt like the boss man. Duke himself put it this way. 
I'm in charge when I make the big wave do what I want. And the more he paddled away from life on the island, the bigger his muscles grew. Till by the time he was 18, he is like six foot, super burly, like very athletic looking, muscular. And one day, he notices a swim race set up in Honolulu Harbor. And he figures just for kicks, he'll compete. So he hops in line next to a bunch of super burly swim team types and... He blows them away. His time breaks a world record. He blew people away so much so that, like, the governing bodies on the mainland in the States wouldn't accept the record times. Why not? I mean, there's a lot of racism. Yes, they didn't believe him. Heather and AJ explained that sports officials on the mainland doubted the ability of Hawaiian people to properly keep score. So Duke's friends and family rallied behind him and raised enough money to send him on a boat and on a train out to Pittsburgh where those sports officials could see with their own eyes what he could do. At first, it was a disaster. They actually had to pull him out of the water. His legs cramped up and he almost drowned. Oh my gosh. He was extremely jet lagged. And also, if you picture the, uh, a indoor pool with everyone around smoking cigars, so... Ew. It's completely filled with smoke. He Ew. Duke said that he could taste the smoke in the water. How gross. What happens next? His friends, they started um, playing ukuleles that night, and that sort of like lightened his spirits and sort of brought him back mm. to a solid, stable mental state where he could sort of refocus. So the next day, all rested up, he gives it another shot, and... He wins. He beats everyone in that pool. And then he does it in the next race, and the next one, and the next one, until he makes it all the way to the Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden, where... He wins the gold. Hurrah! Hurrah! It turned out that all that while he'd been surfing, escaping the crummy parts of life on the island, he had invented a new way of kicking. The Kahanamoku kick. Michael Phelps uses it. It's like a a burst. And so he keeps swimming professionally. He goes to the next Olympics. And the next one, he wins gold after gold after gold. Yep. It feels to me like you don't super care about his Olympic swimming. Yeah. So much. (laughs) So like, we'll just know that's happening. Splash, woo, splash, woo, (laughs) splash, woo. The thing that AJ cares about The reason why Duke's story begins to have a direct effect on his life is because of what Duke does outside of that Olympic arena. What that was after this short break. Terrestrials is back. Duke Kahanamoku is starting to sound like a one-man percussion section. He's got so many gold medals hanging around his neck. clankety clank. Anyway, as he's competing as a professional swimmer, he's traveling to all these new places. San Francisco, Australia, places with... Waves. New waves. New watery hills to sled. I was fired up with the mania for improving my boards, getting the most out of the surf. And so as soon as he was done competing, he'd run out into the ocean in front of beachgoers who'd never seen surfing. In Australia, I think a lot of people had seen surfing for the first time from him. Hmm. There was like a story about him not having a surfboard, but someone brought him like a, like an ironing board (laughs) and like... (laughs) Really? Yeah. And word spread. You know, thousands of people would come to the beach to see him. To watch this human disappear into the waves and then suddenly start hovering above them. If you read the way that they describe what they're seeing, it's like seeing someone walk on the moon. What a picture he presented as he stood upright. The breakers curling beneath him, a smile on his face. So lightning-like was the movement that it might have been flying through space. 
Okay, and now I'm going to turn to my scary page in my notebook where I've been scribbling things um, about the physics of surfing mm -hmm. because and trying to understand what's what's going on that allows humans to stand on water. Do you have any understanding of how the heck it is possible scientifically or so there's, there, how it works? There's a few important things to have a rideable wave. The first thing would be swell. Swell. <laughs> AJ explains there are so many factors at play. The swell of the wave, the speed of the wave, the slope of the ocean floor, the size of your surfboard. Your height, your weight, your body type. How gravity is pushing down and buoyancy is pushing up and thrust is pushing forward and drag is going back. Another factor is wind. So if there's wind blowing out to sea, that's the sort of condition that you really hope for. That's weird. Wouldn't wind coming from the sand slow the wave down and, and, and kill its mojo. Well, that's kind of like what you want because if you have onshore winds, which is the wind blowing towards you, there's nothing to hold up the water to make it into that perfect curl, that, that crest. And if you zoom into that crest, this is where things get really wild. Because it turns out, in a wave, most of the water particles aren't really moving that much. The particles in the water are kind of staying in place, and this mysterious orb of energy is just passing through, hmm. making it seem like it's undulating. Except, AJ explains, at the crest. The little white part that you see, that's where the water particles are undergoing their greatest acceleration. And that makes them faster than the underlying wave. So they're shooting, like they're flying off the top of the wave before falling under gravity's influence. So they just get like a momentary break from gravity? Yeah, they, they're they sort of in their own moment. That is thrilling to think that for a moment, that tip of the water, the crest, the white part where it's breaking, there is an escape, not just in a spiritual way, mm. Not just in an emotional way, but like physically. Yeah, you can see it. Like you can visually see them rushing ahead of the rest of the wave. So back to Duke. Sea spray on his face, hurtling toward the Australian shore, looking like a wizard hovering over those waves. That knowledge, this complicated set of physics that scientists are just barely able to figure out, but Duke had mastered, instead of hoarding it to himself and probably earning fame for looking like he had some magic trick, he shared it. So many of the photos of Duke's later life show him teaching people how to surf, bringing others onto his board, sometimes onto his shoulders. Do you have any mixed emotions about him sharing surfing? No, no. Absolutely not. You can't help but to share it. If you can spread some happiness, that's so much more fun than trying to keep it all to yourself. So I, I really respect what Duke did, taking something that was sacred to his people and, and sharing it with the world. And fun wasn't the only thing he spread. One day at Newport Beach, Duke saw a ship go down in a storm, and he got on his surfboard, paddled out, and ended up saving eight people's lives who were drowning. He's the reason why lifeguards now use surfboards today. And AJ, even though they never walked the earth at the same time, kind of knows what it feels like to be saved by Duke. He kind of changed my life, and it's all from surfing. Without Duke, AJ may have never gotten over his fear of water, may have never been able to step on a surfboard and make Kristen fall in love with him, and then later find a way through the pain after she died. AJ says that after losing Kristen, surfing was one of the only things he could do to feel okay. I think of Kristen often when I'm surfing and She's very much um, integrated and, and a part of the places that I visit. Mm. Memories sort of flood in and come bubbling up. A song, he says. A special song that the two of them shared together 
sometimes comes bubbling up too. Uh, it goes, I love you for sentimental reasons. I hope you do believe me. I'll give you my heart. <laughs> it's, it's a song that brings me a lot of comfort. And out there, surrounded by the music of the waves, he says it's like he escapes for just an instant the world in which she isn't here. Yeah. Um, it's sort of time spent together. And he can imagine an alternate universe where Duke didn't share surfing. And he is stuck on the shore with no way to heal. But thankfully, that wasn't the choice Duke made. And today, out at Waikiki Beach, there stands a larger-than-life bronze statue of Duke and his surfboard, welcoming people out into the water, out toward his true home. Alan, making us feel the feels. Gafinski. Terrestrials was created by me, Lulu Miller, with WNYC Studios. It is produced by the super narnar excellent radical Anna Gonzalez and Alan Gafinski, plus me, with help from Susie Lechtenberg, Sarah Sambach, Natalia Ramirez, Miriam Bernard, Natalie Mead, Joe Plord, and Sarita Bott with sound design and additional editorial guidance from Mira Bertwin-Tonic. Terrestrials is supported in part by Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Our advisors are Theanne Griffith, Aliyah Elijah, Tara Welty, Liza Steinberg, Demby, and Dominique Shabazz. Special thanks this episode to Sia Sharma Gaines, Isabella Leonardo, Jacqueline Kim, Alex Neeson, Makani Tabura, and the good folks at the Child Mind Institute, especially Amani Mansoor and Joanna R. Stern. And biggest cowabungo to AJ Dungo! His graphic novel about surfing and grief and Duke is one of the most gorgeous things I have ever read. It's called In Waves, Run, Don't Walk to get it. And that'll do it. Grab your boards, get outside, stop listening to radio. There's nothing else cool about that. <gasps> What's that? Excuse me, I have a question. Me too. Me three. Me four. The Badgers. Listeners with badgering questions for the expert. Sounds excellent. Okay, here we go. I name my Franny. I'm six years old. Are the shark teeth long? I think it depends on the shark. <laughs> but uh, the shark teeth that I've seen, they're pretty small. 
and I guess they replace them often. So really, you you could find them in the water. Yeah, they sort of shed their teeth all huh. the time. I wonder if there's a shark <laughs> tooth fairy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Fivel. I'm five years old, and my question is. What's your weirdest fight you've ever had in the water by yourself? Kind of a gross <laughs> side note, but yeah, I would please. I would think about that's what we're here for. <laughs> I would think traveling as when I was young, like we'd go mm-hmm. to Niagara Falls, and like I would just spit in the water <laughs> and be like, <laughs> yeah. it's 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 traveling all over the world now. Like I'm I'm all over the world, and I'm. <laughs> Like through the waterways because it's going out to the ocean and then some waves will pull it over there to the continent of Africa and some will go up to the Arctic and AJ is now connected with <laughs> with everyone. Yeah. What I did was you a- thought? <laughs> you really thought that? You were just like, eh, here's a loogie. No, like- <laughs> I, was a, I was an introspective four-year-old. <laughs> I would think about where it would travel and eventually maybe it would come back to me after it's gone around the entire world. And- You'll be taking a shower someday and you're like, four-year-old me is saying hi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hi, my name is Teresa. Next month, I will be 107 years old. <gasps> That's over a hundred spins around the sun. Does the moon have an effect on the surfing? Yeah, definitely. So the moon affects the tides and people can go surf on a full moon out at night. Oh. You know, like there's an, enough <gasps> light out there. You can go surf in the night, in the moonlight, literally. Oh, that sounds like so relaxing and surreal and incredible. People love it because <laughs> there's no one else out. It's just you and the waves. Hi, my name is Finn, and I'm 12, and I have a question. Will my life be worse because I lost my dad? I'm really sorry to hear about that, Finn. Um, It'll be difficult. I think it's important to surround yourself with people that love you and you know that you can trust and share things with. So be sure to ask for help when you need it. Man, it's hard. I I had a teacher that had lost his wife. And when I, when Kristen passed away, he said something that really, it stuck with me. He said that you may never experience closure. You just become familiar with the absence. there's going to be a lot of good that will come in your life. And, you know, you have memories you made with your father that stay with you forever. So Mm. you can kind of have some solace with that. That'll do it for today. If you are struggling with sad feelings, don't forget to ask for help. To the friends and family in your life, you can also call 988, just the number 988, to talk to a friendly voice at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, free of charge, anytime. Uh, We've put that number, as well as some other resources for talking about and living with grief, as well as some fun stuff, drawing prompts and animations that can get you thinking more deeply about surfing and escape. All that is on our website, terrestrialspodcast.org. Thank you so much for listening. Join us next week for the grand finale of this season of Terrestrials when the songbud and I drive down to Kentucky to come face to snout with a creature that scientists thought belonged only in the realm of of fantasy. Catch ya in a couple spins of this watery old planet of ours.